Uh, I'm Bob Seeley. I'm a grandpa, let's leave it at that. And uh, I have a PhD in history from the University of Würzburg in Germany. So if you're wondering where my accent is from, it is from Germany. I'm a historian by trade and training and I've spent the last couple of years, among other things, as the project historian for this Washington Rochambeau revolutionary route. The Washington Rochambeau revolutionary route is a national historic trail that traces the routes on land and on water by the Allied armies, namely the Continental Army, and French forces from Newport, Rhode Island, and from Newburgh, New York, to Yorktown in the summer of 1781, and back up to their points of departure, uh, namely Newburgh, for the Continental Army in December of 1782, and for French forces up to Boston in the summer of summer of 1782, from where they sail to the West Indies, but that's how the army works. Uh, the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route, or W3R, for the French group of Varro for the National Park Service, as I said, traces and tracks the routes of the, those Allied armies to Yorktown. And what I want to talk about today specifically is the route through New Jersey and to Trenton. Because the route through New Jersey that begins on the 20th of August once the Allied forces have crossed the Hudson River from Verblank to Stony Point, the route through New Jersey, which is actually three separate routes uh, across the strait that merge at Princeton and up then at Trenton, is the most dangerous section of the deployment to uh, Virginia. Why is that so? Because A, the Allied armies are split onto three separate routes. The first one is, goes through uh, Springfield, the second Continental Army column goes through Chatham, and French forces are marching mostly inland through Morristown. Why is this the most dangerous section and part of the deployment to Yorktown? That is because A, the Allied armies are split up, and B, this is the only section of the whole trail where Sir Henry Clinton in New York City could potentially interfere, could potentially interrupt the deployment to Yorktown. Once Allied forces are in Trenton, once they are in Philadelphia, the next time Clinton and British forces could interfere is down in Yorktown. Until then, Baltimore, you can't get there by the time you sail up, etc. This is the most dangerous section. By the time these forces reach, by the time these forces reach Trenton, they're almost done with the most dangerous section, but they're almost done. And why are they almost done? Because they have now converged to Princeton and Trenton. And what do they have to do at Trenton? They have to cross the Delaware River. And river crossings, whether this is the Hudson River at Verplank Stony Point, the Delaware at Trenton, the Susquehanna at Hoever the Grace, it doesn't matter. River crossings are bottlenecks River crossings are places where the armies have to get together and those are bottlenecks that are not prepared for these thousands of people and thousands of animals who need to cross the river. Yes, there are ferries, but these ferries are laid out for, you know, a wagon ever so often, a couple of times a day, for travelers, for the post chase on the post road. They are not prepared for thousands of animals. They're not prepared for hundreds of wagons. They're not prepared for the very heavy artillery pieces that are coming with these places. So, if I said Trenton, the march across New Jersey is the most dangerous part. When the LIR forces are in Trenton, they're not quite done yet. They're not as dangerous as Chatham or Springfield. The, con the British forces had been at Springfield. Uh, in 1780. That's not that far. If you, if you ever go to Springfield and stand up on the heights, you can see the smog of New York City 
yeah. even today, if you if you want to. So Trenton, in a way, and the river crossing here at Trenton, in a way, is is a critical moment, a turning point, because now the Allied armies are safe. They are uh, out of out of Clinton's immediate, Henry Clinton's immediate uh, uh, reach, uh, as he as he is watching. Uh, what what uh, the Allied forces are doing. Does Henry Clinton know, by the way, what Washington and Rochambeau are doing, where they're going? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, he knows uh, whatever you think about Major Andre, uh, who is you know, uh, hanged then, or hung, hanged? Hanged, either. Okay. He's killed, executed uh, up there. Uh, he had... Uh, he had uh, created a very efficient uh, spy, op spy operation, spy apparatus as Henry Clinton within 24 hours usually knew what Washington was up to. And he knew that they were going to Trenton and to Philadelphia. Why? Because Rochambeau's son had told his girlfriend to meet him in Trenton. And if he wants to get together with his girlfriend in Trenton, then New York City is out of the option. Why would you send her to Trenton? And so they're on their way. And as you just said, uh, you want to know more. You want to learn more about the house and why and where force these soldiers, these animals, these wagons, the artillery pieces, equipment, crosses the Delaware here at Trenton in just three days. No, that's four. In just four, one, two, three, just four days. The house and wise and wherefores are very closely connected. But since we're talking about the Continental Army under Washington and Rochambeau, we're talking about a lot of people. How many people are we talking about? The Continental Army is about 2,400 people, strong officers and men. You know, at about, uh, about 75 wagons. Every wagon has six oxen. That makes how many oxen total? Six times 75? This is interactive here. <laughs> but a little over 400. Yeah, about 450. Very good. And that's how many, how many legs? Because <laughs> these oxen also need to be shot, by the way, right? They're all shot. So you need, what, 1,800? And then there are a couple hundred horses maybe uh, 450 horses, they also need to be shot. He's a perfect example. You can teach math through history, right? This is all elementary math here. 2,700 people, about uh, a couple hundred officers, servants, maybe a hundred of them, uh, the wagoners, uh, about 50 or 60 women, etc. It's It's a nice group of people, 2,700, 2,800. How large is Trenton? In 1781, maybe a hundred houses, maybe five, six hundred people. And the Continental Army is how many people? 25, 26, 2700 with hundreds of animals. But there's more to come. If the first, in the first units of the Continental Army get here on the 31st of August, 1781, on the 1st of September, the first brigade of French forces arrives here, and on the 2nd of September, the 2nd brigade arrives here. And the French army departs from Greenberg, uh, New York, with about 425 officers and 4,300 men strong. Continental army was how strong? 2,400. 2, and French forces are what? 4,300 and 447. 4,800. Is that all that the Continental Army is? Where's the rest? Because the French Army is twice the size, right? Where's the rest of the Continental Army? They're in home. Down in Virginia. Where are they? They're all outside New York City. Oh. Why? Because Sir Henry Clinton is there with 12,000 men. And the moment the whole Continental Army leaves, Sir Henry Clinton can go wherever he wants to. Then he'll probably go to Springfield and uh, and you know visit every Dunkin' Donut in New York, in New Jersey, around the way. The majority of the Continental Army 
has to stay in New York State and keep an eye on Sir Henry Clinton. Otherwise, he can do whatever he wants to. And this is why the Continental Army that marches actually to Virginia is only about 2,700 men strong. There are more Continental Army forces in Virginia. There's Lafayette's been down there for a while. There's, there's Anthony Wayne who's come down there, uh, who's marched down there from Western Pennsylvania. There are a couple thousand Continental Army forces down there, but the troops that uh, under Washington that march to, uh, to uh, Yorktown and that encamp here in Trenton are only about 27, 2,800 uh, men. French Army, too, is much larger, which means they probably have more wagons. Uh, uh, Jeremiah Wadsworth, who is the chief supplier of the Continental Army, uh, gets reimbursed for 195 teams. Real quick, math, six oxen per team, uh, about 1,100, 1,200 draft oxen. There are another 110 private wagons hired by officers. This is where all their champagne and fromage and what have you comes along for them. So we get to a little to about 305 and uh, we have a bill for 300, uh, 300 uh, wagons. Now 300 wagons uh, at six oxen each makes how many, how many oxen? 1,800. But here's the ferry bill from the, from the uh, Wadsworth papers. Wadsworth needs wants to be reimbursed for expenses. So Hugh Runyon, who runs the ferry here, uh, certifies to supplement 300 wagons with six oxen each. That makes 18 pounds. And then there's to the ferriage of 150 fat oxen. What are they? What, what, what are they for? They're for, what are they good for? They're the hamburgers on the hoof, right? Uh, and they, I bet you anything, by the time they were done here, there were no longer 150, maybe 140 or fewer of these fat oxen. That means if we, that means if we add the, uh, the wagoners, hundreds of wagoners, they are cooks. If we add the officers' servants, and I've yet to meet the French, first French officer who has fewer than two servants, so we get probably a thousand servants and staff officers and what have you, uh, then you get to somewhere around 6,100 people. If we add the Continental Army to that, we get to 8,800, 8,900 people. Trenton is how big? 500. Boston is how big? In 1781, maybe seven or 8,000. Wilmington, Delaware is how big? Maybe a thousand inhabitants. There are more troops on Admiral de Grasse's flagship that live in the whole city of Wilmington, Delaware. Don't tell them that. What is happening here is that in 1781, on the 1st of September, 2nd of September, uh, 1781, as the Allied armies are encamped here, Trenton is at least the third largest city in the United States. New York City is larger, Philadelphia is larger, but after that, uh, maybe Charleston, but Charleston is on the British occupation. I guess if you add the, uh, the troops, British forces are in there, this larger. But the third or fourth largest city of the United States is on its way, making its way across New Jersey and is gathered here at Trenton. What is also gathered here, of course, is what? Is all of the animals. Men, women, and animals all need to be fed, <coughs> right? And feeding those men and these animals is a huge undertaking that goes well beyond the cap capabilities and capacities of a small town like Trenton. In other words, as these forces make their way across New Jersey in, through Pennsylvania into Delaware, <coughs> this must have been like a herd of lo locusts. Herd, yeah, locusts, flock of locusts. What? Many, many locusts who are descending on these communities here. If you read, you know, sometimes that the good ladies of 
uh, you know, Trenton started to bake apple pies for the soldiers who welcome them. They must have started a couple months before they got there because their ovens are probably not laid out for, for something like that. These men need to be fed. And if you wonder why these forces get out of Trenton and cross so quickly, the need to feed them is one of the reasons. Yes, they need to get to Yorktown as quickly as possible because the Gross told them, I'm going to be there only until the 17th or 18th of October or 10th of October. There's a time pressure in there to get down there as quickly as possible, but there's also the possibility or the impossibility to feed them uh, that much. What, what, would you, what would you need for these uh, soldiers to feed them? Just the soldiers, what do you need? Bread. And in order to make bread, you need? Flour. Flour, obviously. You need flour. What else do these soldiers need, however? Meat. They have meat, well, they, they, brought their, okay. they brought their hamburgers. Uh, in there, they need meat. What else do they need for their encampment here? Coffee. Chocolate, more, more chocolate than coffee, actually. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and you can, they get a, uh, some rum too in the morning. It's got to be five o'clock somewhere. Now, what else? What else do they need? They need firewood, right? And preferably not the fences of the farmers around. They don't like that. You know, though that's the best firewood because it's a couple years uh, old already and dry. What else do they need? They need straw to sleep okay. on in their tents. And feed the horses. Yeah, we get to the horses next. But but. Uh, if you look at the list, and I have a list here of 95 names from the Wadsworth papers, 95 names uh, on 10, 10 pages of folks either from Trenton or from neighboring communities like Lamberton, etc., who supply uh, materials to the French army as it is here. Uh, there's firewood on there, there's flour, there's straw, uh, there's oats, there is corn, there's hay, and now we're getting to the animals as well. It all has to be supplied. The fact that these Allied armies make their way all over, can make their way all the way to Yorktown is because of the contributions of thousands of people along the way. Because if an army marches on its stomach, so do the animals course. They too uh, need, need uh, food, hay, grass, etc. We know that, uh, that here in Trenton, uh, Wadsworth pays for 35 acres of, of uh, pasture land. That sounds like a lot, but is it really? How many oxen did we have and how many animals? All rise. Sit down. No, we have we have about 2,400 oxen, and and you know some some on the hoof, and we know from from uh, Berthier uh, that when French forces leave uh, from Alex from uh, Annapolis, there are about 1,500 horses. Give the horses in the Continental Army, you get to 2,000 horses, 2,400 uh, head of cattle. That's 4,500 large animals. You can't put them on 35 acres. That, that's just not enough space. This is what is moving through Trenton as quickly as possible. It needs to be fed and it's pasture, uh, etc. We have all of this for the in the Wadsworth papers. Uh, for the Continental Army we have these in, this information too because while French forces pay in gold and silver and Wadsworth uh, pay station, he wants to be reimbursed with a 5% you know, cut, which makes him the richest man in Connecticut at the end of the war. The Continental Army doesn't have any money, but if you're a historian, that's just fine because the Continental Army calls the quartermasters hand out what? IOUs. Yeah, to be redeemed after the war. If we win, if we don't, well, you're out of luck. Uh, these IOUs, as a couple of Xerox boxes full up actually at Rutgers University in the Nielsen papers show you tell you exactly 
the expenditures here. Uh, and that, that's, that's how we can trace uh, the expenditures of the Continental Army in all of this. Now, these animals, just like these humans, are uh, fed, but we all know what goes in must come out. And Colonel Charles Pettit writes in a letter to Nathaniel Green from Fredericksburg, New York, which uh, actually no longer exists as a historic marker on State Route 311 and State Route 22. The coal community has disappeared. But he writes in October 1778 uh, that, and explains to Green that the grand cause of destruction of men and horses is the innumerable swarms of flies created and collected by the filth of the camp. If we were here, if this were September 1781, and we were here, and you close your eyes, what would you notice? An incredible smell, and, and, and you know, stink, let's just be honest in all of this. And why, why is that so? Because, uh, when was the last time uh, you checked how large, how large a cow bladder is? I did, and I can tell you, as soon as I find it, that a cow bladder is, holds about three and a half gallons of urine, times what, 2,400? It's a river. It's a river. It's, it's almost a thousand gallons per day. And even if they're not here all at the same time over two or three days, uh, I bet you anything, they didn't have to fertilize that land for a while. <laughs> what I'm also uh, wondering is that uh, when we say this is where they encamped, even on this map here, where is it, the Bertie map that you showed, does it tell you what the cattle was? It is not on there. This is one of these aspects that's just never talked about, uh, that they need to be fed, but there's awful, there's all kinds of things to get these armies, to get any army from point A to point B. And as they're marching across uh, into Trenton, it's okay, I, I wouldn't mind being in the first regiment. I'm not sure I want to be in the fourth regiment after a couple thousand animals, uh, oxen and horses. Horses, you know, I pre prefer a horse if I had my choice, but nevertheless. That's another aspect that uh, that is hardly ever talked about. And if and if if uh, Petit talks here about uh, the destruction of men and animals because of the filth and the dirt, the the uh, hygienic conditions that you have in there must have been horrendous. They lead to diseases, which is why the New Jersey Department of Health would have shut this campsite down mm -hmm. in no time if they had been there in 1781. Plus, I wonder if they had a permit to do that. Uh, so if you add the, the uh, horses to that, uh, which also have uh, sizable uh, bladders, you get to about uh, something like between 10 and 11,000 gallons, maybe more <coughs> over two or three days. That's a large tank truck of, of uh, diesel or gasoline in there. Uh, and that's just the software, right? Because there's also hardware, there's also feces, which, you know, and enough of that, I kind of added it together. Something like 85 tons uh, that these animals uh, leave. Not just here, but along the way, because they leave along the way. There's an account in a, in a pension application, for example, that these, that these uh, is six uh, oxen, ox cart, was put on board a uh, vessel in ahead of Elk in Elkton and went all the way down to Yorktown without stopping uh, with these six, 12, 18 oxen on there and horses. That must have been, uh, must have been quite an experience, especially when there was a storm. Anyway, uh, uh, these, the, the fact that we have such horrendous uh, 
health conditions and hygienic conditions is another reason why these troops need to get to and want to get across as quickly as, as, quickly as possible. Uh, there's time pressure, there is the need to feed them, and there is the hygienic conditions because, as you said, it doesn't tell you on the on the maps where the where the actual cattle is, but I tell you, any, I'm convinced that these four squares that you showed, uh, where the four regiments were, changes from day to day as they come in because I sure wouldn't want to put up my tent on the same spot where people had slept for three days already in the straw and what have you. It gets really filthy, and uh, as you can can uh, imagine. It's 1781, as I said, Trenton is the largest city along the route of Allied forces and it is a very busy place. How did they go get across the river? Well, Hugh Runyon's bill uh, is for 2,770, what are we, 2,744 officers and men. How large did we say the Continental Army was? And we got all the servants, etc. Where are they? Some of them are Lausanne's Legion. Those are cavalry. They cross wherever they want to. So the Delaware, uh, at that point, uh, is somewhere is around three feet, three feet deep. If you're on horseback, that's not a problem. If you have a wagon, uh, that's not a problem either for the cattle to get through. Uh, there, and there's a fort up there. Anyway, you can get across. It was deeper in the 18th century. The other day, somebody asked uh, earlier today about uh, uh, the river isn't that deep anymore. Well, they were much deeper in the 18th century. It's all, it's all sand. And those of you who've been to Williams, to uh, to Wilmington, <coughs> where the, the Quaker houses are on the Brandywine, ships could go up all the way up there to where the I-95 bridge is now. This is how deep the brandy wine was. Now, you know, it's what this deep if you're lucky. So the, the rivers were deeper back then. But the majority of, of uh, men uh, either waded across the river at the fort, because I'm sure Mr. Runyon didn't take him across for free. And this bill is dated September 3rd, and then there's one for September 4th. So the crossing is done. So they must have just either uh, cross on the wagons, riding on the wagons, or walked across. Three feet doesn't sound very deep, right? But just goes but up to here, right, to my hip. Uh, would you like to walk across here, and then you have another what, six, eight hours of walking in your squishy shoes and wet pants on, etc.? Probably not. But if there's not an option, uh, that's what you have to do. The officers were on horseback; they didn't really. Uh, they didn't really care all that much, with all due respect. Uh, they came across somehow. We know some of them, uh, uh, of course, crossed uh, uh, on the ferries because uh, Wattsworth had to pay for it, or rather Rochambeau had to pay for it, but the majority had to use the fort to get across as they were then marching down to the next encampment, which is at the Red Lion Inn, or was at the Red Lion Inn. You know where there was the Red Lion Inn? That's Red Lion Road right there. It's yeah. just, just before the university, when you drive down here, just before the university on the right-hand side. And it's an airport nearby. Yeah, there was the Red Lion Inn, there's a historic marker now, because in 1998 or 1999, a couple of kids broke in and emptied the the money machine there, and then in order to hide their tracks, they set it on fire. And now yeah, it's, it's all gone. That's just a historic marker. And then from then, they march into into uh, uh, Philadelphia, and then on down to Yorktown. So the crossing here at Trenton is an important important a pivotal point in the march to Yorktown because the most dangerous section is over, the part where Clinton, Henry Clinton could still have interfered in the march. It's a place where a large section of the Continental Army actually embarks on boats and sails past Philadelphia down to Christiana 
and the Christiana River, uh, right next, they got off the boat right next to the shopping mall, and then went down the old Baltimore Pike, past Coochers Bridge, down to, uh, they went to Hollingsworth House, it's on the left hand side, and then down to Plum Point. Plum Point is the same, and there's a marina there today, and the little restaurant is exactly, uh, when you stand there you can see Cecil County Courthouse on the other side, exactly the point where Sir William Howe had landed a couple of years earlier. That's where they, from there, they sailed down all the way to the Chesapeake, to Yorktown. Many of them, uh, actually two on the China James River, many of them on boats that had been built in Albany, that had been built at Wappingers Creek along the Hudson River, uh, and then, then Rhine Bay in this area until you get, get to uh, Stony Point and where Planks Point, where a lot of these boats were then put on wagons carted across the New Jersey to Trenton by the 2nd New York Regiment. Sometimes you read that the Allied, that the Allied armies depart from Dobbs Ferry, which is true, but only some of them. They come from, all the way from Albany, they come from uh, Newburgh going through the, through the clove, end up uh, uh, best Earth past Erskine's tomb, end up in Pompton. They cross at Dock Ferry to Sneedon's Landing, the New Jersey Brigade, and marches into New Jersey. They come from half a dozen different departure points. At Trenton is the first time that the Continental Army is all together on this march that is already 10 days, 12 days old. Because again, the Continental Army is spread out and you want to spread them out simply because of the need to feed them and their animals. But once they are here in Trenton, uh, the most dangerous part is over. They come across uh, one way or another, and now they're on their way to Yorktown and victory. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. A question. Uh, Lawrence Township uh, next door is very interested in the rear guard in, encampment on the Shabakunk um, uh, near Notre Dame High School uh, now. And um, my thought on the, rear, on the rear guard encampment there and previously up in Kingston was that they were shutting down the bridge both directions. They didn't want traders or spies coming north and they didn't want stragglers straggling into town uh, going south. So that they were just shutting it down overnight. Is, is that a, a realistic picture? Well, I did a little report on that for Dennis, uh, what's his name, Waters? Waters. Yeah, for him uh, about, about that. And it's the 2nd New York Regiment the last, it, that, that is there uh, to, to uh, keep an eye uh, on the loyalists, but then again, there's, no matter how many loyalists there are, you've got to be crazy to take a pot shot at a couple thousand French or Continental Army. Unless it happens once in Connecticut, there's two or three uh, fired at them, and then they ran away as quickly as possible. So that's that's uh, yeah, theoretically the the risk of a British attack by the time you're down here is fairly small, because you. The British can't sneak over here with a couple of thousand of them. Just like the Continental and French Army can't take back roads to find their way across New Jersey. If the eighth largest or the third largest city in the United States is on the way, you know, it's, there's no secrecy involved there anymore. Uh, I'll go back and reread yeah, the letter. But, but, the, but talking about uh, well, one of the reasons why they are there is behind, behind uh, these armies, Follows uh, follow a couple wagons, uh, actually by a man named Loomis from Lebanon, Connecticut, to pick up uh, the sick, the people with blisters, etc. They can't, who can't walk anymore. They pick up those stragglers along the way, uh, and and uh, that's what whom the the second New York is is waiting for, and the other. Uh, segment of the army population that they're waiting for is who? Deserters. These are deserters who uh, 
want to, am I moving around too much, who, uh, deserters who want to go where? Philadelphia. Oh, they want to go Philly? Philadelphia or Baltimore. And why? Then you get on board a ship and you make prize money, you're much better off. There's actually, uh, and this is always a risk uh, there. There's actually, a, I just finished a report on Rogers Tavern on the Susquehanna, on the other side from Haver the Grace. And he actually, uh, there's actually, actually found a note by uh, Chevalier de la Luzerne, who is the French ambassador in Philadelphia, tasking him with intercepting uh, French soldiers, French deserters, who might be on their way to Philadelphia to get on board uh, ships and and you know go into uh, letters of mark. They can make a ton of money, much more than than uh, they would pay. They actually probably got got uh, through. There's an uh, uh, an interrogation of three French soldiers, deserters, in the Sir Henry Clinton papers in in Clement's library. <laughs> These three guys were in the hospital in Providence and they took their discharge papers from the hospital in French and marched all the way across Connecticut until Shelton from Shelton's horse intercepted them, said, who are you? And said, well, we are, you know, we are, we are on our way to Philadelphia. We're supposed to join our unit down there. And then they get a real pass from Sheldon, because Sheldon doesn't know what these hospital papers look like. And one of them is from the De Pont, the other Bourbonnant, the third one is from Lausanne's Legion. No different, uh, different regiments, different units, and they actually make their way into British lines when they are then interrogated by Delancey and handed on to Sir Henry Clinton. So desertion uh, is an issue. That's one of the things that we need to learn from this. And the other thing that we learn from this episode is what? Learn French, because if they had, <laughs> if they had known French, their guys would have gotten away, uh, gotten away with just uh, getting across Connecticut with the hospital discharge papers. Yeah. And they also, how do tradespeople go with them? I'm thinking about the shoes. If over a two-year period, shoes were resold seven times. Mm -hmm. Going through a town of 500 where there might be one or two cobblers is not going to take care of everybody in this massive crowd of locusts coming through. So how many, did they have cobblers that were traveling with them? Did they have other tradespeople who they needed, tailors, other for repairs and, and providing you know, the necessaries that were there? How would they have tagged on to the group? Every soldier that signs up at age 18, 19, 20, 21 has had a trade before he signs up. So they're in these, these regiments have any number of cobblers, tailors, etc. A trade that they have before they sign up. The regiments are self-contained units, the economic, the business units in there. And the opportunity to fix shoes or mend clothes, etc., is highly sought after because it means extra income. The soldiers who have skills like that, or farriers who can shoe these horses, right, get paid extra. Sometimes they're actually uh, free from usual soldier obligations so they can do that. Uh, and they kept busy. I've, I, uh, again, somewhere, must be not the Clemens Library, I forget it. I have a list of uh, requests of buttons for the saint Honge Regiment, I believe, sent to France just for the one regiment of 900 people to replace the buttons that they have lost along the way to Yorktown. And the request is for how many buttons? Exactly 144,000. <laughs> because every uniform has how many buttons? A lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot. A lot. About 40 metal ones and about uh, 30 small fabric ones. Okay, so that's 70, 80? Yep. 80 times what? 
900 men, 1,000 men, there you get your 80,000 buttons right there. So the supplies that were needed to utilize these things through the soldier skills, they were supplied by the regiments and not carried by... No, but the red, they were buttons, things like that, uniform parts, came from France. If they needed thread or things like that, that was purchased. I have some uh, purchase uh, agreements. They were purchased locally so that they, that the uh, tailors, etc., then had had sold the buttons on things but like that. they were that. supplied through the regiment. The, the regiment purchased that, purchased not individually. Okay. Like for the horses, there is one. Uh, there's one, again, one receipt in the Wadsworth papers, I think, they're ordering uh, horseshoes for all their horses. Uh, and they come from Pennsylvania. And that request for horseshoes is for 20,000. Mm -hmm. You know how many wagons of horseshoes those are <laughs> along the way? Yeah, and, uh, and, and again, those are things that, you know, every, every little community probably has a, a farrier in there, a blacksmith who can do that, but not if there are 1,500 horses coming through and 300 need to be reshot. You know, that takes days in there. So if you can't, if you don't have the trades people who can actually do this, uh, you can go on campaign. But the, the, if you look at the trades, uh, the occupations, the training, that soldiers have when they enlist and it's all in the controls, uh, then you find that, yes, yeah, some of them say laborer, but most of them have a specific trade already, which they continue to use while they are in the service, while they are in, the, in their regiment. And it is an opportunity to make some money. There's a, and then I'll, I will uh, you know, shut up. There's a complaint for, from Lausanne's Legion, for example, up at Newport. Once, when they just got there and the troops got off the boats and there's all kinds of repair work and things to be done. And they complain that they don't have an opportunity to, to help throw up fortifications, earthworks, etc., because they're constantly out there riding patrols looking for British and loyalists and what have you. And that deprives them of the opportunity for additional income. And they say, you know, just send somebody else there. We don't have to be on horseback, send some people out there who are walking. We also want an opportunity to earn an extra income. I, I have another question. You have women that are also traveling and family members of the men. Were there a number of pregnant women? Uh, probably. We, uh, we do know in French forces that uh, they come just quote me. Some, they come with something like three children, but when they leave, there are five. <laughs> and within three years, usually <coughs> takes nine months, so within three years. Uh, but we don't know how many of them died in between. You know, the women and children are irrelevant, really. Uh, they don't show up in the records. We don't, we, we don't even have the names of them. They simply show up on ship registered because you, uh, they have to you know, they have to embark and they need to be fed, etc. But while the armies are here, uh, I don't, there's one case of a, a Lausanne's Legion uh, hussar, uh, hussar. So anyway, when they're out in Charlotte Courthouse in Virginia, uh, he gets married. And he gets married in, in the morning and, and then they go on a honeymoon and in the evening he has to be back in camp. And uh, Miss Rady, she does return uh, with her husband to France in there. And so now they're in, over in France bitching about Macron, their descendants. So, but that's the only case that I know, just like I only know of one case of a, of a woman getting pregnant down in Williamsburg. So, but other than that, women just don't exist uh, administratively. Neither do they for the, for the Continental Army and if the if they can get rid of the of women uh, in the Continental Army, they do, including Washington. The when Hazen's regiment and Hazen's regiment comes from Canada, uh, probably has the largest number of women and children because those are French refugees. And during the Yorktown campaign, they most of them stay up in Fishkill uh, on the Hudson there, dozens of them. And while their husbands are marching to Yorktown and 
and are in the siege of Yorktown, and it is in the middle of the siege of Yorktown that these women and children, uh, that the food allowance for these women and children is withdrawn because the husbands aren't here, they might as well find a job. Uh, and as fortunately, the administration moves very slowly in the 18th century too, but nevertheless, they, but eventually that their food allowance is withdrawn until the husband, husbands come back a couple months later, if they do. So, you know, they're a necessary evil, but if you can get it, and this, uh, this happens with full, with full approval of Washington because he signs the orders. It's not like Washington doesn't know about it. So, but anyway, as I warned you, if you get me started, you're going to be here for dinner time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Deborah Samson, some well-known names, but that's, but as soon as it was found out, they were thrown out. Yeah, the patriarchy was still strong, it's still strong as we know.